Hello, everyone. I'm Lara from Iprosima, and today I'm going to host this embedded working group. Thank you very much for, for attending. No, 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 no. Just continue. Just continue. Okay. Um, in the document I'm sharing, please write that, write that your name on the attendance list. Also, you can add topics you wish to discuss to the miscellaneous section. Thank you. I would like to start. I would like to say that after we finish this working group, there will be the kickoff of a new working group about artificial intelligence in the integration working group. It will be in the same meeting room as this embedded one and it's available for, for everyone. So please feel free to join and contribute to learn. Okay, so let's go. We are going to recap the last the last meeting room in May. And we were talking about building robots one ball at a time. It was a test driving development of micro ROS with, with Renault. Also, we watched uh, the demo Turtle Boss 3 ROS based robot body controller UC Air, Air Aim family. It was made by Renesas, Japan. And finally, our colleague Pablo Garrido talked about uh, the latest micro ROS enhancement. So now let's go with the with our agenda today. Uh, wait a minute, please. So now first we have the launch of the new Vulcanexus framework. This is the all-in-one ROS2 toolset, and one of the goals is the integration of micro ROS, the, re the resource constrained device simply slide into ROS2 network. Our colleague, Eduardo Ponz, will present it. Then, the second topic, it is a use case about a drone swap in the cloud. Javier Peris will present a micro ROS application scenario in which a micro ROS based device is controlled through a remote machine in the cloud via the DDS router. DDS router is the technology that allows to seamlessly communicate geographic, sorry, geographically distributed edge devices. And finally, we will talk about the latest release of MicroRos Humble, which integrate microcontrollers seamlessly into ROS2 Humble host wheel. And after each talk, there will be a time for questions and, and answers. And now is the turn of Eduardo Pont and the Vulcanexus framework. So, Eduardo, if you want to please continue. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Eduardo. I'm, I'm also from Eprosima. I'm here to uh, present or talk to you about, introduce you to the this new hot topic in ROS2, which is Vulcanexus, uh, which is, a, we call it an all-in-one ROS2 toolset or kind of a ROS2 flavor uh, that we are compiling. You can see my screen, right? I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, yeah, I can see that. You can yeah, see we that. can. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, this all-in-one ROS2 toolset, uh, as we call it, which is uh, basically a flavor of ROS2, which uh, includes a further tooling that we develop here, uh, and it has some other advantages that we'll go into detail in a second uh, regarding ROS2. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, needless to say that it is uh, Vulcanexus is an open source software stack, right? Uh, so actually, uh, you, you would see in a second because I, I, I want to run a small, very small ROS2 nodes CPC demo. Uh, uh, you probably know about the Docker listener demo on Vulcanexus, just so you get the feeling that you know uh, your feeling would be the same as using ROS2, but you would actually be using uh, newer versions, uh, more bug fixes, uh, further tooling, etc. That includes Vulcanexus, but your experience developing over Vulcanexus would be exactly the same as you know what you already know on ROS2. And furthermore, actually, your your current applications will work on Vulcanexus out of the box. You don't need to do anything uh, but sourcing one environment instead of the other. So the Vulcanexus environment instead of the ROS2 environment. That's all you need to know to make it or all you need to do to make the transition, uh, as we'll see in a second. Um, I wanted to say that you know we have uh, put this together kind of in a um, package uh, 
or modular modularized uh, manner in which we have um, what we call Vulcan score, which uh, it's composed of ROS2 uh, or, or the, 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 the base of ROS2. But what we do there is that we take out the FastDPS version of uh, ROS2 and the RMW FastRTPS version of, of ROS2, and we put our own newest versions. That means that, you know, uh, if you're running ROS2 Galactic, for instance, then you are you're using FastDPS 2.3, uh, or if you're running uh, Vulkan Nexus, you are, uh, Galact uh, Humble, sorry, you're using FastDPS 2.6. And then you will always be using on humble FastDPS 2.6 if you if you stick with ROS2. If you move to something like Vulkan Nexus Humble, which is a how we call this uh, brother distribution or you know sibling distribution uh, for Humble uh, of Vulkan Nexus, in there what we do is we actually put the newest version of FastDPS. So you have uh, all the stability of the ROS2 API and all the uh, and of the ROS2 packages. Your applications are the same. But under under the hood, you have the newest version of the middleware, which is you know as it's always uh, more up to date. It uh, it performs better, uh, and then it has uh, corrections if something has uh, has come up or whatever. We actually do that not only on the fast DDS, which is the actual middleware, but also on the RMW fast RTPS layer, which is the connector between ROS2 and fast DDS. So we make sure that on the connector you have the latest possible version with the most performant version, the, the less or the, the, the one with mo most up-to-date fixes and, and new features, right? So uh, around this uh, Vulkan Exus score, what we've built is uh, four different packages. One it's called uh, Cloud, and actually my colleague uh, right after, uh, Javier Paris, will talk about the DDS router, which is a tool that you can actually install from Vulkan Exus and use, you know, you install with APT installed uh, Vulkan Exus Cloud, and then you have the tool that he's going to be talked about, talking about. Um, it's a uh, so it's a uh, cloud package provides uh, software components to use ROS2 in, for instance, microservice uh, microservice architectures or you know internet connections. You know th those things where ROS2 is limited or uh, as of now it's a uh, kind of limited to local area networks. Uh, in Vulkan Exos, we are including this so to to enable cloud and internet communication of your robots uh, with Vulkan Exus. Uh, we also have uh, Vulkan Exus Micro, which is uh, kind of the same idea as in FastDPS. Is the ROS2 um, Micro, or, or is the same idea of the ROS2 Micro, but it's the newest versions that we ship of the actual XRC DDS middleware, which is you know what's under the hood on, on Micro ROS. So you have, again, all the stability and the functionality you know from ROS2, but in Vulkan Exus, you get it with the latest version of the actual middleware. That's, that's what we're putting there together. And we are distributing it into an, in, a, in an easy manner, right? Because you, you can install it with, the, with APT on, on AMD64 architectures. Um, we have a simulation package because uh, we didn't want our users to be kind of limited to, to Gazebo, which is a great tool. But we also, you know, we find that WeBots it's also a great tool. So we've built a simulation package uh, around around it. So you know, you can install other simulation uh, software uh, in an easy manner, um, and you again will have the latest version. No matter what you would have in ROS2 in, in Vulkan you will always have the latest version in a compatible way with the with your applications API. And and then you have the the tools package, which uh, um, it's actually a pretty cool uh, feature of Vulkan Exus. And it's one of the, the great advantages of Vulkan Exus is that uh, uh, you can do introspections on the performance of uh, of the middleware in, on runtime. As you're running, you can see you know uh, measurements of uh, throughput, latency, whatever, because FastDBS is built with a specific module that is not distributed in ROS2, but it is on Vulkan Exus uh, that allows you to monitor uh, this kind of statistics is not only limited to latency and throughput. There are 17 measurements, as far as I remember, and we have a graphical tool as well. So you know where you can draw graphs and things. Um, so um, well, I, I, actually, I, I went over uh, some of the things, but I, I skipped one, uh, some of other ones. On the core, we also include secure ROS2, uh, which is something that you can install on ROS2, sure. But we are actually providing extensions, or Vulkan Exus is right now providing extensions over security in ROS2, uh, namely the possibility 
of storaging your private keys into uh, hardware secure modules. This is a uh, hardware that is specifically designed to store things like private keys or certificates, right? So, you, you know, it's it, it's in the form of a card or, or a USB plug that you can plug and unplug from your robot. It's, it's a more secure way to secure your ROS2 deployments if you're interested in doing so, which is, you know, uh, getting a whole and whole topic, I would say. I actually gave a talk on on the ROS developer day, developers day regarding Vulkan Exos. I made some demonstrations and one of the key things that I wanted to demonstrate is how to uh, leverage Vulkan Exos to make a more secure ROS2 deployment. Um, uh, and then we also, of course, have the ROS2 discovery server that uh, you might uh, might know already. Uh, again, you would have the latest version. And this is what we our, I was talking about. In the cloud, you have the DDS router and the tools, you have the monitor. Also, we included a version of the uh, famous DDS shapes demo, which I don't know if you're familiar with. Uh, it's, a, it's a tool, a graphical tool to kind of play around with the different DDS QS settings, get a feeling of what they mean, what they are. We So we built a shapes demo that it's uh, compatible with ROS2, where you can, you know, publish things uh, with ROS2, and you can uh, actually see the shapes moving in your shapes demo and things like that, right? So, and you can actually just subscribe to the ROS2, uh, to the to the shapes demo topics from your ROS2 application if you're interested in in doing that, and you can, you know, play around with the different QSs, what they mean, etc. Uh, micro and simulation. I already told, said, said about that. Um, I wanted to make sure that I transmitted to you, and I, I would I would uh, make the demonstration with the Docker actually that we are distributing Vulkan Exus uh, using three different strategies, so to say. First, we are uh, distributing binary or Debian packages for uh, AMD sixty four architectures uh, targeting Ubuntu twenty o four for for Galactic and twenty two o four for Humble as ROS two is right. Um, if you can, if you cannot, uh, or you're not running on, on said architecture or operating system, you can build Vulkan Exus from source. I will uh, scroll into the documentation a bit. Actually, uh, let's let's jump there. Um, so we have a documentation a documentation page where you have uh, different installation guides, right? So I was talking about the binary installation. If you are familiar with installing ROS2 on your on your laptop computer or whatever. You you find this this is exactly the same thing. Basically, you add an APT repository and then uh, and then you do opt opt apt install Vulkan Exus humble based desktop wherever. Um, you can build from sources and you would find that it's the same thing. So we are very focusing on you don't have to change anything in your workflow to use Vulkan Exus, but you get all the benefits from the latest versions and the tooling, right? So uh, it's it's. Uh, an only win situation because there is no learning curve for you uh, into making the transition into Vulkan Exus or anything. Um, so in the installation from sources, you would find it's basically the same thing. You download the build dependencies and then you get um, some some code from from the ROS2 packages, also from our uh, overlays over that, and then you basically run Falcon build somewhere along the along those lines. It's, if you have followed the building from sources guide from for ROS2, you would find this is exactly the same thing. You don't need to do pretty much anything. You are, you already can do this. Um, that's if you need to build for a different target than the ones we're distributing so far. And lastly, we are also distributing distributing a, a Docker image that you can actually uh, download from our super cool web page. You'd see that uh, you know we have a. Uh, super cool, I would say, uh, but uh, uh, it's the operating the operations teams here that uh, put this together. But we have a super uh, cool website. That, you know, make sure you you check it out. Um, and if you go into the download section, you can download the the Docker image that I'm going to use uh, just right now to make the the Docker listener uh, simulation to to see that you get the same feeling. Right? Um, and that's a uh, as as for actual components, uh, this is just a list of the packages that Vulkan Exus uh, can can or or have. You can install with APT. We have the core, 
tools, micro cloud simulation, and then we build or put together a base and a kind of a desktop. So you are, you know, you're probably familiar with ROS2 base and ROS2 desktop. We wanted to do similar things. So you guys have an easier time to, uh, you know, choosing one or the other. Um, uh, so, so, you know, it's basically the same workflow uh, as I was saying. And then uh, just to finish with my presentation, if I have time, I wanted to, uh, I, I already downloaded the Docker image, uh, so, you know, because uh, else we will be downloading for a while on the presentation, doesn't make much sense. Um, so I have this uh, Ubuntu Vulkan Exos, in my case, humble desktop image, right? So I can run that. I want to just run the Docker listener. So you see that actually the workflow is exactly the same as you would do on, on, on ROS2, right? So- Can you increase the, the, the size? Uh, sure. Just don't know how, but uh, <laughs> that's actually quite a bad. Control plus uh, may do it. Uh, nope. There we go. Yeah, control scroll. Yeah. That that did the trick. All right. Oh. Um, thank you. So Ubuntu, Vulkan Exus. I, I'm I'm guessing you're kind of familiar with Docker here. Uh, so we can run this. And actually. Uh, since you are running the, the image, the environment is already sourced, but I'm just going to source it anyways, just to show you how, how the workflow would be. So you would source OPT, Vulkan Exus, Humble, setup.bash. You see that this is the same thing that you would do on a, on a ROS2 installation. And then I'm going to do ROS2 run uh, demo node CPP listener. Uh, I guess you are familiar with this demonstration. I'm gonna leave it there, and then I will connect to the same the same Docker container. Let me make this space slightly bigger as well. Yeah, okay. So now Docker exec minus it, and is this one the one I want? Bash. So I'm I'm I, I logged in into the same container. I need to source the. Vulkan Exus Humble setup uh, installation or environment. And then I can do ROS to run demo nodes, CPP Docker, and uh, see that we have communication here. Uh, what I want to show here is that, you know, your workflow would be the same. Your application is the same. This uh, node, node, demo node CPP Docker is the ROS to demo node CPP Docker. We're not doing any, any magic here. Uh, so the a a API is 100% compatible with ROS2 Humble. API is 100% compatible with ROS2 Humble. You only get the advantage of newest uh, versions of the key components of uh, ROS2 if you if you move uh, your application into into Vulkan Nexus. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, I know I don't know if you guys have any questions or. Um, if you if you want to see a kind of a um, longer demonstration because the, the, this was only 15 minutes of of what Vulkan Exus can do, uh, and the ROS2 developers say they would release I guess in the in, within the next couple of weeks or so uh, some YouTube videos and it's a presentation of 40 minutes right where I'm uh, where I'm talking about um, presenting the the fast DDS monitor as well and how to monitor your DDS statistics and your middleware statistics with Vulkan Exus while you're running your robotic deployment. Yes, so. sorry. <laughs> just, just to mention it, uh, Vulkan Exus also has the, the Micros agent already installed. So if you install the, the micro uh, part of, of Vulkan Exus, you will have a, a ready-to-use Micros agent. Yes, exactly. So thank you very much, Eduardo, for the talk. So we continue now with our next talker, Javier Paris. Javier, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, Welcome. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. <laughs> okay. So I'm also from uh, Eprosima team, and I'm going to present you uh, a new tool, a new application that we have developed called DDS Router. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, I don't know how to present that. Well, okay, I think this is uh, this is fine as well. 
So uh, I'm going to present the DDS router. Okay, this is a new application that we have developed uh, in Eprosima, and is uh, perfectly compatible with uh, MicroRos. This tool is uh, very useful to um, uh, for scenarios where you need to connect with a cloud or just to connect uh, multiple uh, ROS nodes uh, in a one uh, network. Let's say a, if you are under different uh, routers or you have a dynamic uh, robot that cannot be uh, attached to one LAN, to only one LAN. Uh, I want to present this um, this product uh, focus on the uh, micro ROS scenario. And uh, we have chosen uh, to explain it uh, a drone swarm scenario. OK, so let's start from the basics. We have a drone with its sensors. OK, and this drone con communicates uh, by ROS2, OK, using the micro ROS agent that connects with your uh, microprocessors, OK, or your microcontrollers. Uh, now, let's say that uh, we want to connect two different drones, OK, that are under the same LAN. So we can use the we can perfectly use the ROS2 uh, communication capabilities, um, but this has already some um, not disadvantages but limits. Let's say uh, first of all is that you need to be in the same LAN, okay, uh, and you need uh, your your network to have multicast capabilities. Um, this is not uh, exactly a requirement because you can configure your middleware to work in uh, in different lands or without multicast but the configuration is pretty hard and uh, it does not allow dynamic discovery or it gets very tricky when when you have a uh, big networks okay so and finally let's present the the actual scenario that we want to solve with this with this new tool okay uh, it would be that you have uh, multiple drones okay that you want to communicate uh, them with each other, but they may or may not be under the same LAN. Okay, even they can change from one uh, from one network to another, and then you also want to communicate them with a cloud uh, a cloud framework that you have somewhere in around the world. Uh, it doesn't matter where. Okay, you can use well Amazon Web Services, Azure, whichever framework you want uh, with Kubernetes or whatever. So how can we uh, achieve this uh, this kind of a scenario using uh, using this DDS router? So let's start with the basics. We have the DDS basics. Okay, you have a publisher that uh, publishes messages to subscribers. Okay, and this publisher, this agent, uh, publishes the messages from the microcontrollers. Okay. Uh, now, if you have different LANs, this gets tricky because uh, you don't have um, multicast capabilities okay so you need to use initial peers it's called uh, so you need to know where you are and where are the uh, participants that you are communicating with okay then you also would need a tcp configuration uh, that's not uh, uh, not a requirement but very suggested um, and also port forwarding in case that you are under a NAT. I mean, if you are uh, behind a router, the router changed your IP, so you have a private IP, and you cannot communicate with the with the rest of the one. Okay. So for this, uh, we have the uh, DDS router. Okay, DDS router is uh, um, an application. Okay, a process that you can uh, execute in your in your machine, and what it does is uh, to, it creates uh, a bridge between your LAN, okay, the, the internal part of your LAN, and the rest of the world, let's say, the, the one uh, network that you are working with. So uh, what you can do is uh, having one DDS router in your LAN, one DDS router in cloud, in uh, let's call it cloud, but could be also another LAN or wherever. And they are going to communicate between them with uh, very few configurations. I mean, of course, you need uh, to know the IP and a port available from uh, from one of the routers, okay. But the config the configuration is much simpler than uh, configuring the whole middleware um, uh, underneath it, okay. So we have the same scenario: a publisher that is uh, uh, from the agent that is publishing messages from the microcontrollers, and in the other land, uh, subscribers, okay, receiving uh, messages of this topic. 
So uh, the DDS router is completely dynamic. This means that the, the, the new DDS routers uh, can be attached to the same network. Uh, it can uh, forward messages and receive messages and forward to the to the internal LAN, okay? And it does not replicate messages uh, in the way that uh, if you have a publisher and a subscriber in your in the same LAN or even in the same computer, they are going to communicate to each other in the most efficient way. I mean, if they can, they are going to use uh, shared memory or they're going to communicate via uh, uh, via DDS without the router. And the router just forward those messages uh, into the network, into the internet, okay? So uh, the main features or main uh, capabilities of the DDS router are that uh, it can communicate easily one uh, uh, one networks. I mean, DDS uh, networks that are in different lands, also over TCP, over TLS as well. Uh, is designed for uh, distributed, distributed DDS networks. I mean, finally, DDS is for distributed networks, so you don't need a single point uh, of discovery or a single point of communication. Okay, every point is independent and can communicate with the rest of the of the network. Uh, it has an uh, it has implemented an efficient data routing. It does not copy the messages. Okay, it, it just forward them. So it's a zero copy implementation. It's easy to deploy. Uh, as I told, this. Uh, an application, okay, and the configuration is uh, via uh, JML that is uh, very simple to write. And also you can uh, filter different topics. So you can, um, well, I can show you in the next example, okay. You have two topics, for example, position and temp. And let's say that you don't want topic temp to be uh, forward to the next, uh, to the other LAN, okay. So you can uh, filter that topic just using uh, in this configuration, in this GML configuration, a whitelist, and you say which topics do you want to to forward, and so temp is uh, is discarded from the router. Okay, this is very useful when you have uh, very big networks and you just want some of the messages to be shared within the cloud or within different lands. Uh, so finally, the scenario that we achieve is uh, you have two different and completely independent DDS networks that cannot communicate with each other because they are under different NATs, uh, under different uh, LANs. There is no multicast. And you use the DDS router to create the bridge. Okay. Uh, also, uh, just to show you, there is, uh, I mean, it is possible even uh, to use a DDS router as a discovery server. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, discovery server mechanism in fast DDS, but it's also uh, the DDS router can work as a discovery server, okay? And this makes the DDS router network dynamic, okay? So every new LAN or any every new participant that want to communicate within this uh, network can also run a DDS router and it's gonna automatically automatically be uh, communicating with the rest of them. Uh, OK, uh, are we fine? Sorry, can, can I continue? Yeah, you can. Ah, yeah, OK. So uh, okay, uh, here, just to summarize the, um, the scenario that we uh, that we achieve here in uh, with the DS router, and uh, let's turn back to the drone swarm scenario. Okay, so uh, what can we do if we have this scenario? We have two drones uh, that are connected with the same or even different uh, in different networks. Okay, so they may not discover each other because they don't have uh, they don't have multicast capabilities, or they even change the IP. Okay. And you have also a cloud where you want to receive the data from the drones. So the scenario will be like, that, like this. You have every drone with, with its um, sensors, okay, its controllers uh, that are communicating via the micro ROS agent. Okay, the micro ROS agent communicate uh, with uh, ROS2 as a participant of ROS2, or as a, as a node. And this ROS2 will communicate with a DDS router that will also run in the in the core, in the main computing of the of the drone, so this uh, 
uh, this makes available for the drone to communicate with every other ro every other ro uh, drone independently of their uh, networks okay also it can communicate uh, via tcp it can filter some topics so not all the topics are sent uh, are sent in the network but just the ones that the that are desired and it can communicate with a uh, ROS2 node uh, in the cloud. Yes, again, uh, executing a DDS router in the cloud. Uh, here in the cloud, you can use Kubernetes, you can use uh, whichever uh, cloud framework that allows uh, to run fast DDS. And yeah, and finally, uh, as Sedu has told before me, uh, the DDS router and everything. Uh, mentioned in this presentation is available in the new distribution of Vulkan Nexus. So you have access to it, it's very easy to install and uh, very easy to use. Uh, and that's that's all for me. Uh, do you have any questions or any comments? I just have a quick question and that yeah. is, um, in you know DDS or on ROS2, you can uh, assign a certain quality of service um, yeah. parameter, and in this uh, router, the DDS router, does it forward or does it uh, yeah, use it is, also uh, this quality of service parameters, or is it something something? Yeah, it's else? a very very good question. Uh, right now, I mean, at at this moment, the router is uh, in beta testing. I mean, in in a beta version. Okay, we are in zero three zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have it in our roadmap. Uh, we call it the transparency module. So the, the idea is to forward every quality of service from one point to the network to the other, but this is still not working. I mean, uh, it will, but... Uh, not but it's on a roadmap, okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. So currently it's just uh, default or let's say it's just... Uh, yeah, it uses the, the less restrictive uh, quality of services for writers and readers. So, for example, the, the, the reader must be uh, volatile VC4, so it can uh, read messages from, from every writer. Yeah, I mean, the, the messages are received by the router, whichever, whichever the, the endpoint is, but it's not going to be transmitted the quality of service. Okay. Thanks. Here we go. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Javier. You're welcome. Okay. And now is the turn of Pablo, who is going to talk about the last release of Microsoft Humble. Mm -hmm. So, welcome, Pablo. Okay. It's your turn. Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope that that you can see my screen. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a, a brief recap about the the last uh, Microsoft release that is Humble Hashville. Uh, we have released it uh, just one week after the ROS2 Humble release. And well, as you may, not, may know, uh, this new ROS2 release is using by default the, the newest version of Proxima's middleware. In the in the side of ROS2, they, they are using fast DDS, and of course, in the side of uh, Micros, we have a uh, MicroX as DDS as the default middleware for for Micros uh, Humble. And I will I would like to to just uh, briefly mention we, which are the the most important things that we have upgrade or which are the new feature that we are offering in in Micros Humble. But of course, you also have them available in in, in Galactic and in Foxy because we are just like backporting all, all the thing and most of you should be aware of this of these things but just in order to recap uh, the most the, the the parts that we have upgrade in 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 the last year are mostly the, the middleware layer the the user api the rclc the, the layer that the the micro user used to to code the, the applications also we have improved a lot the rmw layer the the connector that connects the the ROS2 stack the micros stack with the with the middleware and we also have increased the micros hardware support we have port micros to some uh, rtoss and some platforms that are really really interesting and also we have done a lot of bug fixings and performance improvements that are super hidden things that we have 
improve that that makes Microsoft a, a, a product that is ready to to be used in production. First of all, we have a, we are using in in the last uh, Microsoft version, a Microsoft CDDS version two dot one one, both in the in the client and in the agent side. Uh, the, the the most important features of this uh, micro CDDS release are the binary entity, entity creation mode that allows the client to create uh, micro publishers and subscribers in the in the agent using the as low bandwidth as is possible and, and optimizing the, the throughput and, and all the things related with the entity creation. We also have add a multi-thread support in the middleware layer. And this allows the whole, uh, the rest of the microsoft stack to to be run in different threads or or process or tasks or whatever your RTOS call the the concept of of multi-thread uh, uh, execution. Uh, now we or or middleware is is uh, multi-threading, so microsoft in in a whole with fewer restrictions is also a multi-thread. We have add can FB transport. So Microsoft can communicate with the Microsoft agent using CanFD. Uh, we have created a, a thing that the community uh, requires to to us that this is a multi-serial agent. If you have a, I mean, if you have five boards uh, running Micros and using a serial transport, you can connect them to the same agent, and this same agent will be in charge of act in in behave of every each uh, Micros uh, client using one single agent. We also have a, a kind of shared memory uh, transport in the client. So if you create a publisher and, and a subscriber that are compatible, that, that match in the same hardware, in the same MCU, uh, the client and the, and the agent side will be aware of that and will allow uh, the data to be uh, passed through the, through the memory from the, from the publisher to the subscriber. So you don't have extra uh, extra communication in the in the in the transport because normally the micros transports are uh, low bandwidth so you have to save uh, as much as possible in order to to allow a uh, high throughput and a low latency communications we have had also the the hard liveliness check this is a super cool feature because normally with the with the xcdds ping ping the the client uh, is able to to ping the the agent and be aware of the status of the agent so the client can can check if the agent is available but what happens when you disconnect your board is able the, the Microsoft agent to to be aware of the status of the client in order for example to remove the 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 raw geograph topics well with the hard liveliness check uh, feature enable the Microsoft agent will be aware of what is happening in the embedded part so if you if your board uh, just disconnects or or go to or goes to a hard file or whatever, uh, the the Microsoft agent will will be in charge of communicating this information to the rest of the, of the Rust two uh, side. And of course, we have done a lot of bug fixings, performance improvements, a lot of minor things that makes a uh, Microsoft CDDS a, a ready to use uh, middleware in, in embedded applications. Well. In the opposite side, in the in the top of the Microsoft stack, we have the RCLC, as you may know, that is the, the C99 API that uh, Microsoft offers in order to program uh, using ROS2 concepts. In the, in the RCLC, you have nodes, publishers, subscribers, and a lot of things. But with this new release, we have, uh, we have to mention that we have now support for the concept of a uh, ROS2 actions. You can code uh, uh, an action client and an action server in the in the Microsoft site, and you have a uh, adapted API that allows you to to create entities that are able to communicate with the ROS2 ones. Also, we have prepared an RCLC parameter server. So I think that I made a, a presentation about that in in another embedded working group, but with a Parameter server in the in the embedded, in the, in the embedded site, you can have uh, interesting things such as, for example, configuration uh, variables or or, or or operational modes or, or whatever you want, just using the 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 ROS2 parameters APIs. You can check which are the parameters available in your embedded board, 
uh, which are, is the status of each parameter. You can dump all the parameters together. You can load a whole uh, a set of parameters in the in the in the board. You can use the the parameters in the same way that you use them in the ROS2 uh, nodes. And also we have add uh, this is a minor improvement, but, but we have extend the creation uh, the entity creation API in the RCLC in order to allow uh, QoSs. So uh, you have these uh, utility functions for creating like a default publisher, a best effort publishers. But now you also have uh, an API that uh, that allows you to to tune the QoSs that you are using in micro so you for example you can tune the the durability the liveliness or all the things that are available in the dds data space that supports ROS2. okay in the in the rmw layer in the in the layer that links the middleware with the rest of the ROS2 stacking in micros we have add uh, this uh, side api that we offer in micros that is really interesting but if you have used micros you should be aware of that but we are not the, the user of micros not only interacts with the with the middleware using the apis that ross to provide but also have a side api that uh, allows to tune to fine tune the the embedded uh, micro x micro x DDS middleware in this case we provide a day timeout api where the user can fine tune the middleware in order to set how much the middleware should block for every operation that it makes. For example, if the default mm, 10 seconds for, for session create, creation is not enough for, for us, we can increase it, we can modify the, 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 the max time that the middleware will block for creating a publisher and all the things, all the, all the, all the parts of the middleware where you have a timeout, you have uh, this uh, API that expose this, those timeouts and can be configured at runtime depending on your real time requirements and all the all the thing also uh, we have achieved with this release a full static memory rmw for micro xcds that means that we do not have any dynamic memory in the rmw nor in the micro xcds middleware so uh, from the rmw to to the bottom of the stack, the, the micro stack is completely dynamic memory free. You have, as you may know, you have still have uh, some dynamic memory just in the configuration time when you are creating entities in the in the RCL. Uh, and this is because we are using the same RCL that ROS2 use in order to, to be compatible. But in general, in the middleware part, you don't have a dynamic memory. And of course, in the whole micros, you don't have dynamic memory usage uh, in runtime when your entities are publishing or subscribing or doing whatever they are doing. Uh, we have integrated the, the binary identification mode that I have mentioned in the RMW. So micros by default creates the, the, the ROS2 entities, the publisher, the subscriber, in the most optimal uh, way using the binary mode. And we also uh, have been experimenting a little bit with new RMWs. And we have achieved uh, a proof of concept using embedded RTPS. That's, that is an, an RTPS implementation. RTPS is the, the, the wire protocol behind DDS. And it's a, a lightweight implementation of this uh, wire protocol that is able to, to talk directly with fast DDS. So using this RMW, your Microsoft nodes will be able to communicate directly with ROS2. But this has a uh, tons of configuration procedures and you have to be aware of a lot of things. It's uh, just a proof of concept in order to, to show that Microsoft is able to, to use a other kind of middlewares. In this case, we have support for that in, in, Q, in STM32 QYDE. If you use a lightweight IP network stack, um, free Arctos, if I remember well. And also you have it available in the ESP uh, IDF. That is really interesting because all the expressive ESP board have Wi-Fi. So you will have your board with Wi-Fi talking directly with, with Rust2. Okay, we have increased a little bit the, the hardware support. The new platform that we support in, in the, we have had support in the last year, are uh, Microsoft Azure RTOS, uh, Texas Instrument uh, Tiva C series that are uh, a series of MCUs. And we also have add support to STM uh, from ST Micro, STM Cube, both IDE and MX. Uh, 
you can integrate micros directly on those uh, frameworks or, 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 or IDEs uh, by means of a super simple uh, instruction that we provide here in the in the repos. You have the, all the information available in, in our in our in our site. And also, we have had a recent uh, support for platform IO that is a super useful uh, platform for for working in embedded that allows you to seamlessly integrate a lot of boards, a lot of RTOSs, a lot of uh, APIs. For example, you can work with it. Arduino API using Platform IO, but now you have a module here to integrate micros in in, in Platform IO. We have test some boards and it works very well, but the user have report uh, to be working with this module in in whatever board because Platform IO supports I don't know but thousands of of boards, and we have of course upgrade all the all the all the ones that we had in in the other versions. Uh, we have upgraded the, the ESP IDF for express, Expressive, we support Zephyr, Embed, Natex, uh, Micros for Arduino, the, the pre-compiled libraries that we offer in the Micros for Arduino module, and we also support Raspberry Pi Pico, uh, Pico SDK. And finally, we, I, I, I would like to mention that with Humble, we are moving to a modularity approach where the Micros stack is built for platforms uh, in, in, in a module set. We are, we are not going to support more uh, environments or platform using the micro setup package, but we are going to create new packages or, or modules for using micros in different architectures or platforms or, or reference boards or whatever. And finally, just to mention, we have done a lot of work uh, debugging, uh, bug fixing, and improving the performance of, of micros. Uh, we are achieving a, a stack that uses a very few static memory and very few stack memory and almost zero dynamic memory at runtime but with every iteration we achieve a, a memory consumption that is impressively uh, low we have ha, we have improved a lot of uh, a lot the, a lot the multi-threading support we are uh, log free we have use cases production use cases with with partners in in a proxima that are using micros in a multi in a big multi-thread environment and we do not have uh, logs or 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 dead logs or, or whatever so micros in in if you follow this the instructions works pretty well in, in a multi-threaded environment it is in kind of re reliable because for example we have the ping or the hard liveliness feature that I, have, that I have mentioned so you can rely on the communication between your mcu and your draws to a uh, site and of course, it is a real-time reading because we are uh, we are developing a solution that allows user to tune every single blocking call or use advanced real-time features. For example, like the the RCLC executor that is it, it is designed to be uh, real-time. So Micros is a, is capable of running in a hard real-time environment. So that's all. Uh, I hope that, that you use uh, Micros Humble, and as always, if you have any any problem, any issue, any question, we are available in the Slack channel and in the in the GitHub uh, repos. You can open uh, the issues you want. So thank you very much. Any question about? No questions. Okay. Well, uh, that's all. I want to thank everyone for attending. And I hope you found it interesting. And remember, we'll be back next month with many interesting topics. So please stay tuned.